All right, so I titled this F and Get Started Already because really um, a lot of people hesitate to get started in flipping because they feel like they have to have all the puzzle pieces in order to jump in. Now, I don't want to say everyone does that because they're, not everybody does that, but a lot of people do. A lot of people hesitate. They were you know, in this group last year. They still haven't bought anything. They talked to somebody five years ago. They still haven't bought anything. And really, that's... I'm here to go over some things you've probably already heard, but just to let you know maybe a couple of other pieces so that I can encourage you to just get started. Um, there's a lot of fear around flips, especially in a market that's happened, like our market right now, <laughs> where we just you know saw some increase in prices and now we're stabilizing or finding that pricing on the downturn a little bit. And so a lot of people are fearful of purchasing right now. So we'll talk a little bit about that. I'm going to go over a few things of what this is going to look like. So meaning I'm going to talk a lot really fast. And then at the end or maybe somewhere in the middle, we'll, we'll ask if, where you guys can ask me questions. Um, and that way you're getting what you came here for. Does that sound good? So Cassie, click. All right, so we're going to go over today what your flipping capacity is. So as I mentioned before, different people are doing flips at different paces, whether they're new or they, you know, know a lot about it. Some people will jump in. And there's people in here that kind of just want to do one maybe a year. And then there's people in here that maybe want to do 15 or 20 a year. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and maybe go ahead and define that today for yourself. And when I say define that, we're just talking about maybe for the next 12 months. You don't have to define who you are in flipping for the next five years. We're just going to talk about what are you going to do and how are you going to focus over this next six to 12 months. We're going to look at um, where you're flipping properties, how you're finding the deals, what your actual focus in that business. So from here on out, we're going to call this flipping a business. Okay, so whatever else you do, if you're going to go into flipping, we're going to look at it as some kind of role in a business that you're creating, right? So is, am I right to just assume that almost everybody in here wants to flip and own a property themselves? Like, do they want to, do you want to own the property and flip it and make the money off of it? Is that yes, hands? Pretty much. Maybe some people that are like, just want to throw cash at someone. And then we have some, okay. And then we have some realtors and we have... Uh, insurance companies and, and lenders. Okay, so uh, we're going to look at that, what your actual focus is, and then building your team around flipping, and then we are going to go over calculations. That is a question that I get a lot. How do I know what to buy something for? How do I know how much to put in it? And what can I sell it for? So I have put a um, calculations from a flip that we recently did, what we bought it for, what we put into it, what the lender cost, what the all the sales costs were, and how much we made. And then I've got like an easy calculation for that. Sound good? Perfect. Let's go, Kese. All right. So right now, um, I'd like to just focus a few seconds on you identifying whether you are beginning your flipping business. So you're going to spend about 10 hours per week. You're at the point of saving money. So you don't really have a lot of cash and you're educating and you're maybe going through some type of mentoring. So you are a beginner. So identify yourself as a beginner or maybe you're investing part-time or you're a part-time flipper. You can invest about 20 hours a week. Um, you do have a career or you have something that's funding uh, your normal daily life right now. Flipping is not funding your normal daily life. And you have some stash cash or you can get your hands on cash and you are still saving money and you're still educating yourself and you're still going through some sort of mentoring. So we've got your part-timers and then your full-timers are 40 hours a week. You have some sort of financial support. Um, maybe your actual flipping business is financially supporting you and um, you don't really have other career commitments so you can really invest full-time into this. And then you've got stash cash or, or you have some kind of a relationship with somebody that you can get cash from. So just on your notebook or on your paper, identify whether you are beginning, part-time, or full-time. And then by three M's, these are just like normal focuses. What is your market? Where are you getting your money? And what is your mindset around it? 
So really quickly, your market, are you looking on Zillow, Realtor.com? Are you into the whole Bigger Pockets? Anybody on Bigger Pockets podcasts, um, other podcasts or YouTube? Learning from that, uh, maybe a part of the PIG program here or another investment group. Um, interviewing realtors and contractors and making connections. So all of this follows, falls under your market. Um, Knowing realtors, having conversations with them is a great way to learn what's going on in your market. Every market is different. I talked to somebody today selling a house in Idaho. They were asking me, hey, you know, should I put my house in the market now to buy a house down there? Well, Idaho is different from here. I have no clue where in Idaho they are, but it's just different. Where you're at, the market is different there. And realtors, unless you're just looking at this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis and in it, realtors are going to know that, uh, or busy realtors are going to know that. Um, and then making contractor connections and other connections as well. So coming to groups like this, asking friends and family or people on Facebook about the contractors in that area. It's different everywhere. There is, I've met people that even are here now. I don't know if Willie's here, but he's got people that followed him from South Florida and they're flipping properties here. They're not from here. They, he brought his entire contracting crew from South Florida and they're here flipping properties. So, you know, how you build that in your market is, is how you're going to do it. But we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then where you're getting your money, I'll go over that later. And your mindset. Here's the thing. How you show up in places like this, like I know some people love to hear people talk and some people absolutely don't. They're like, just get to the point. I want to hear all that. You know, how you show up here and how much you're paying attention here is how you're going to show up there at the houses from house to house to house and everywhere in your life. You know, how you're showing up at home, how you're showing up in the fitness realm or the health realm or, you know, with your family. That's how you're going to show up in your business as well. I fully believe that. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. And then just being consistent. Um, if this is not the group for you, find a group to get in or find something to connect to on a the weekly basis. I mean, daily basis would be podcasts, right? 30 minutes or 10 minutes or 20 minutes a day, weekly basis, some kind of mentoring that you meet every single week. And then monthly basis, some kind of networking event like this where you're around rubbing elbows with the right types of people, having those conversations about building wealth and seeing what they're doing or what they're doing different. Okay, so right now, I just want to identify with how... Um, I'm sorry, why it's important to you. So for some people, this is just purely financial. I want to build wealth. I just want more money. It's purely financial. So what is flipping to you? What part of it? Or maybe there's something with just a lot of money in the bank. And they're like, I just feel weird having it sit in the bank. And I want to do something with it, right? So there's a bunch of different you know, areas of fulfillment. People say there's 7 to 12 areas of fulfillment of your life. And and I chose the 12, um, whether it's fulfilling some kind of physical thing for you. There's actually people that just want to work on houses. They, there's people that have full-time jobs and they will go and they will work, you know, two or three hours. They just like to do it. They like to demo. They like to drywall. They like to do those things. If, if that's you, then that's you. Um, some kind of mental thing you, you like to, or intellectual, you like to constantly be improving yourself. And so flipping is just something you want to get into because it's just that next step and you feel like you need to go that next step. Um, it's a personal thing or a, I don't think it's going to be spiritual or love affiliated um, or social, but financial, yes. Career, yes. Adventure, yes. Contribution, maybe. Maybe you just want to make extra money building that legacy you're talking about, you know, possibly building something for your kids in the future. So just having an idea of what your why is. So I just, I always like to go back to this in coaching. Anytime I coach with people is we're talking about flipping. For some people, it might be new. And I'm pretty sure most people, unless you just retired from a 40 hour a week, don't have like this gap in your week. You don't have like tons of time and tons of mind space, right? So where, and, and I do this whole four leg thing because I'm like, I just picture a chair. If a chair, you're sitting on a chair, you got four legs. All right, I've got my family I'm focusing on. I've got this career and it's kind of new maybe. I'm putting a lot of my energy and effort into it. And then I'm over here like, I gotta have my own time. I gotta take care of myself, gotta go to the gym. You know, and then you know, over here you might have some hobbies. I like to paddleboard or I like to go out on the boat. 
you know, and then you start adding all these other legs, you know, maybe you're uh, committed over here, committed at church, committed, you know, for this other thing. This is a business. So just come with the understanding that wherever you were in the beginning, where we talk about 10, 20, or 40 hours a week, that you've got to like, give up something to do this. So if you don't recognize that now, then this is just going to be a frustrating journey for you. So you might be moving from 10 hours a week to 20 hours a week in flipping or 20 to 40. Maybe you're doing it already and you're wanting to do it more. But we have to start recognizing, do, where's, our, where's our capacity at? Are we adding a bunch of legs to our chair? Do we even have the time, energy, and effort to, to place in that? And, and I like the word capacity because it talks about not just your time, but it talks about where you're at emotionally, where you're at physically, where you're at mentally, where you're at intellectually, and where you're at financially. So for some people I talk to, they want to get into flipping, and they're like $30,000 in debt. And, and that's, that's a goal. It needs to go on your dream board. But we need to backtrack a little bit and get ourselves in a better financial state so we can start this new business. Does that make sense? So just understanding where you're at for your capacity in your life to add something new or just add on to what you're already doing. Um, everybody has got tons of stuff going on in their life and I just want you to I just re-look at this 10, 20, 30, 40 hour week and go ahead, Cassie, and go to like, what, what are you gonna commit? And let's now, instead of talking about six to 12 months, let's just talk about the next three months. Where are we gonna commit for the next three months in this journey to flipping, okay? Because none of the stuff I'm gonna talk about is gonna matter if you don't visit this first. And, and half the people in here probably already have thought this out. They've probably you know been through this already, but I just wanna start here because flipping, even if you're only flipping four houses a year, it's a big deal. It's a big business, unless you're just handing somebody cash. If you're actually buying these properties, you're talking to realtors, if you're making the decision to purchase something, it's going to take some capacity from you to do this. Um, I did put on here, uh, define like what, so I would say, why are you flipping? What are you flipping? So um, we'll start here. And then, I want to go in, this is all just going to be the meat side of things, right? So let's just identify for you guys, wherever you live, some kind of community. Are you wanting to flip multifamily, single family? Are you wanting to be in Fort Walton, Niceville, Crestview? What area do you know the best? What area do you, have you seen somebody flip in that you're like, hey, that was really awesome. I like that house. Or you feel comfortable. Go ahead and just write down one or two, maybe three things that you, that, that, um, define where you're going to be flipping, what you're going to be flipping. Just really quick. Multifamily, single family, you want townhouses, you don't want townhouses, condos, you want to stay away from condos. If you don't know anything about them, then stay away from them. If you know more about single family, then look into single family. Um, if you want to only flip in areas that are available to short-term rent, then write that down because that, that'll be a point of interest for you to find out where it's even legal to short-term rent and where it's not. Um, if you're a Navarre person, if you wanna be in your base, if you wanna be near the school, whatever that is. So really why I say this is because if you're all over the place and you're one of those that say like, I'll just take whatever the deal is, like you're gonna be all over the place for a long time, all right, because initially, unless you have tons of cash to throw out people to find your deals, then you're gonna be the one doing the research and you don't wanna research that many homes and that many areas and really start to understand the market in that many different places. So for me, it was Fort Walton. I wouldn't even go out of it. Even for my realtor business, I was here, I had multiple kids, I had a drive model school, I didn't wanna be that far. I just didn't wanna go out of the area. I stayed away from condos because I knew nothing about them and I didn't want to learn. I didn't want to spend the time to do that when I could spend the time lead generating in the area I already knew. I could pick up the phone and talk to somebody and I didn't have to research what the answers were when they asked me questions about that area, right? So we want that area to be super small. And then as you build your business, you can build that area. Now, when I say this, it doesn't mean that something is not going to come your way 
that you shouldn't look at. So if I'm researching Fort Walton and all I want is Fort Walton and somebody calls me and says, I have this deal in Crestview, I'm going to go look at it, right? Now, if they tell me they have a deal in Baker or some area I don't know, I'm going to be like, or, or Pensacola, sorry, I'm not. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I just don't know the area and I don't, I don't have the capacity right now to learn it, right? So define your small area. And then we're going to go into um, your price range because I don't know. For me, there's just I'm not a million. I don't want to say this because Jared's get mad at me, but million dollar market's not my thing. Like I've been researching the 500 and less for so long. I just know it like the back of my hand. And I've sold so many homes. I sell anywhere from around 80 to 100 homes a year, and I don't really touch the million dollar market. And that's just me. That's just what I'm comfortable with. I would suggest that you go with what you're comfortable with, where you live, where you used to live, where your friends live, something like that. With something that you're just comfortable with. Again, I wasn't comfortable with condos. I didn't go with condos. I hardly even looked at them. Not that they weren't good deals. It just wasn't my thing. Um, okay, so, and then studying values. Now, you have your own way of looking at values, right? And I promise you there's somebody at your table that does it completely different. All right, so do not, I'm sorry realtors, again, I'm a realtor, but don't solely rely on the realtor. I have seen a lot of investors buy and rely on the realtor and they were wrong. And the amount that they told them that it would sell for, the amount that they put in was just, it just wasn't right. Now I'm going to backtrack with a little story. There are realtors out there where they came from the investor mindset. When I was 21, I think that's about when I graduated college, but I read a bunch of books in college about making money. And real estate was so prevalent in them. And I really didn't understand a lot because I was a military brat. We never bought houses. We just moved. And I think we, there was at one point, I think I calculated, it was like 13 times in 12 years. Like we just house to house to house to house. I knew a lot about houses. Um, none of them were renovated though. Um, but the, you know, for me, I was like, I just, I want to be able to work for myself. Like working for people wasn't, you know, and it was actually just inspiring to create. I was like, dang, you can buy something, you can do something with it, create like this whole other environment out of this house. And so I got my real estate license and then I started knocking on doors. I wasn't even thinking about flipping. And I knocked on this door, I'm like, what are you doing? He's got a dumpster outside and he's just knocking stuff out. I'm like, what the heck are you doing in here? And I'm like, you own this? He was like, no. And I'm like, well then really, what are you doing? And he was like, I'm, I'm, I'm renovating it. And I was like, what's renovating? <laughs> and I'm, then I had my real estate license at this point and I had no clue what he was doing. And he told me, he was like, oh, we're doing this. And I'm like, so you bought it. Somebody sold a house for less than what you could sell it for on the market. It, it was mind blowing for me. And it actually took me time to understand that that was out there. Like somebody will actually sell their house for less and not do the work. And then somebody else could do the work and then they could sell it. So that began my journey of searching, figuring out what the heck flipping was. And again, I was 21 years old and I learned really fast, had a lot of time to ask a bunch of questions. And then I found out that this guy didn't make that much money because he was the one that was actually doing the work. So I was like, well, what's the other guy doing that owns the house? And that's when I really understood that in order to make money, I had to buy a house. And this was the time, this was really weird, y'all, but this was, I was not the person that needed all the puzzle pieces to put together to figure these things out. I went, again, researching. So back then, I'm almost 40. We did not have all these apps. I don't even think my phone had apps at that point. We had white pages, and we had the internet. So we had phone books. And I would go around, and I would write down addresses, and I would go back to my office, and I would search them on whitepages.com, and I would find somebody, and I'd say, look, this house is just sitting here. What are you doing with it? Can I buy it? And negotiated, didn't even know what I was buying, negotiated, didn't have the money. And then I was like, oh, I guess I gotta go to the bank. So I went to a local bank and I was like, hey, I wanna buy this house and I could put this into it. And I got that contractor dude to come over and tell me 
I'm like, hey, like, how much is it going to take to do this if I demo everything? So I was excited to get started. And, you know, he, the bank was like, yeah, let's go look at it. <laughs> they actually walked. This was back when they would walk in the houses with you. Like, he went to the house with me. And he was like, yeah, I think you're right. I think this will make this much money. And you can do it in this amount of time. And I was like, yeah. So that was my first flip. I didn't have a lot of pieces. And I didn't even know what I was getting into when I did it. And I promise you, it might not seem like it, but that's seriously how it can go. It can really go that way. If you put your mind to something and you've got that capacity of time frame to start educating yourself, you don't have to have all the pieces. You will put it together just like that. I promise you, if you walk in here next month and you've got a house to buy, you will find the cash. You will find the lender. You will find people to invest. You will find all of those pieces because the gold is in those deals. When you have those deals, when you find those deals, whether it's you or somebody else, if you have the deal, you will find all the other pieces, right? And then you can always call me and I can confirm your ARV. All right, so let's find the deals. Um, how many flippers in here? Just if you flipped one or more. All right, how are you finding deals? On market or off market? Both? On market, raise your hand. A little less? Off market, raise your hand. A lot more, okay. So why are the deals off market? better. So most people look for off-market deals because <clears throat> there's less competition, more competition, price can go up. Um, on-market deals, there's still a lot of money to be made. I think we've bought a lot of on-market deals. We get a lot of off-market deals now, but initially we got a lot of on-market deals. Um, finding realtors, you don't just have to have one. Some people like to just have one, but you don't have to initially. Letting everybody know I'm in the market, I want to buy something, I want to buy something, and letting them go out and send them to you. But make sure you're doing your due diligence. Look at the property, ask them what they it'll sell for. Do your own research. Again, going back a little bit, you've got to know your market, you've got to have the education, and then you can jump into to this side a little quicker. Um, Off-market deals, why do they not want an agent? So why this was a big deal for me because I thought it was really awkward that somebody was selling a house without an agent. I'm like a realtor at this point. Don't you know you can get more when you have an agent? But there's a lot of reasons why people don't want an agent and they don't want to go to market. And if you understand that, you will stop talking yourself out of talking to these people. Because a lot of times there's how many people have driven by a house that is distressed? How many of you have knocked on their door? How many of you have knocked on their neighbor's door? Right? So like less than half of the people. It's like, why? Why are you talking yourself out of it? Right? Because there's reasons why these things are sitting there. And you got to mentally understand that so you stop talking yourself out of it. They don't want an agent because they're embarrassed. The house isn't presentable. The home's in bad shape. And that's okay. There's mold, there's garbage, there's water damage, there's some kind of destruction. I bought a, or I didn't buy it, but I represented somebody that I got to buy a house and a tree fell through the roof. Like, and it was sitting there for like six months. So intimidated by people coming in. Again, going back to the embarrassed side. The biggest reason is because agents want to make the house presentable and sellers don't want to do anything to it. They don't have the motivation, they don't have the money, they don't have the time. And now it could be a roof issue or an insurance issue of some sort. And, and I don't know how many times I've had conversations with people. It's so overwhelming for them to even have the conversation. They've got this house sitting there and it's a problem, but it's even more painful to talk to you about it. It's even more painful to have to talk to whoever they have to talk to to sell the property, whether it's family members tied into the you know, estate property or, or things like that. So think about these things. These are the things that you have to understand in order to start finding the deals and being that person that solves their problem. The uh, pre-foreclosures, probate, absentee owners. Absentee owner means that um, the person doesn't live there. Burned out landlords, people that had rented a property. They were the landlord for 20 years. They don't want to be a landlord anymore. Um, they're behind on taxes or bankruptcy. They're going through divorce. Some divorces, they don't have to sell. Some of them are court ordered to sell. 
Um, but understanding those sorts of things puts you in a position to have those conversations everywhere you go, whether you're knocking on a door or whether you're sitting at the bar somewhere. And then obviously there's free ways. There's tons of ways to buy leads and you're gonna spend a lot of money doing that because the, the actual return on that is one, two, three percent. Um, but there's a lot of free ways. So driving for dollars means drive around, find a stressed property, knock on their door, knock on the neighbor's door. And if, how many people are actually willing to do that? How many people have done it? So I would challenge you to do it like within the next five days. And if I was really hardcore, I'd say just do it tomorrow, but I'll give you five days to think about it and then do it. Um, door knocking, uh, that door knocking could just be People aren't going to bring you deals if they don't know you're looking for them. If you are in, if you have a neighborhood, I, I, when I started real estate, I was in a townhouse neighborhood. Very first thing I did was walked around with my kids in a stroller and just knocked on the door. I was like, hey, your neighbor, I've been here for a couple of years and I'm in real estate now. If you don't have anybody or do you have anybody you're using? <laughs> it was just awkward, right? But door knocking is really a really good way to get over yourself um, and also have those conversations. Awkwardness is actually a blessing sometimes because people, you know, at, when they see that you're like funny about it or awkward about it, and then you really start to just let them know, like, look, I, I, I have this dream of putting my multiple kids through college, through investing in real estate. I really want to buy something and I'm just out looking. If you know of anybody that maybe has something they want to let go of, I would appreciate a call and give them the number. And then you'll get better and better and better at it. But door knocking doesn't have to be just on distressed property. Um, friends, there's a lot of people, it's so funny, that their friends will give somebody else a deal. They're like, wait, what about me? Like, I'm, I'm buying too. But you're not having those conversations with them. Even in casual conversation, and this does um, go for social media too, right? It's, I'm looking for a house. <laughs> I need to invest in something. Does anybody know of anything? And then doing that multiple times, or do it every day. People might unfriend you, but you know, do it like every couple of weeks or so, but letting people know you're serious about it. If you are out door knocking, take a selfie, and post it on Facebook, and go, I'm out door knocking, trying to find a property to buy. You will be surprised how well that will do for you. And um, obviously videos, and, how many people video themselves and post it on Facebook? One, two, just keep doing that because I'm going to keep doing it and I'm going to keep getting the leads for all of that, okay? All right, I'm going to keep not doing it. It actually is a really good way. So if you can get over yourself on video and start posting those out there, it's a really good way. Cassie, ready? <laughs> She's so scared. Oh no. The <laughs> You didn't do anything. All right, so solving people's problems, really this um, can be and it should be a relationship journey between you and um, probably a handful of people. If you got about 20 people that were for you and you were for them, you could probably really build a long-term wealth business through real estate. Um, and I mean just people that send you friends that they have, people that are just pro you and you know pro what you're about. Um, and this will only happen if you get really intentional about your time. Um, and I, that, I, that comes from experience. I am the person that does 50 things and is always trying to get rid of plates and minimize. And I will probably always do that. But I do know that when you get really intentional about it and you create those relationships and slow down and really they know that you're serious and you know your why and you're speaking about that, those leads will start coming in. Next. All right, y'all ready to build a team? So this is the roles that I could think of at the moment when I was writing this. This is not probably all of the roles on a flipping team. I know it's kind of small, sorry, Bill. <laughs> so this is all the people that it takes. Can y'all see it? So in, at some point in time, you're gonna be a lot of these. You're gonna be the person finding the deals. You're gonna be the person analyzing the deals. 
You might be the person writing the contracts. You could have a realtor write the contracts. Title companies, I mean, I'm not a title company, but some people that are investors, they're the title company too. The lender for purchase, lenders for rehab, and lenders for down payment. There could be three different lenders in this, and you could be one or more of those. So when I initially started, I bought the property myself and I invested fully. I was a partial contractor because I demoed the place. I actually laid tile in that house too. I found that deal myself, but you don't have to play these roles, right? If you're in groups like this, and if you're networking amongst people that are doing the same thing that you're doing, you don't have to play every single one of these roles, but understanding them is important. There's obviously bookkeepers, accountants, um, people that sell the property, people that value the property. There are some people that will buy it, but they need somebody else to value it for them. They need somebody else to sell it for them. General contractors, roofing contractors, some people are their actual contractors, or some of these, or one of these. Some people don't have general contractors. They actually manage the whole thing, and then they hire subcontractors. And then, of course, demoing designers. There's people in here I know that are realtors for flippers, and they'll actually go pick out everything. They'll pick out the floors that people are buying, the, the, you know, the colors for everything, and fixtures, and then people that pick up materials, people that, um, that focus on your timeline. Uh, I mean, money is time. So if you're gonna buy a property and you're not gonna flip it for a year, you might not make that much money. So there's timekeepers too, and then people that manage. All right, so finding people. This is a really big deal for people that have started flipping. So once you get a house, the last thing you want is for it to sit there, right? Because time is money. So if I give you $50,000 and you go buy something, I'm gonna be like, the day you close, who's demoing it, right? Or I don't even know who, but is it being demoed, right? Is there somebody in there in that property? So if you're a beginner, if you're the 10 hour person up here or even the 20 hour, you should be finding people. You should be having a list of contractors, of people that you have met that do these different things because you will meet these people. And I have, I've seen a lot of people that meet contractors and they don't have a property, they don't write their names down, they don't, you know, I didn't, you know, put them on a sheet like this is my tile person, this is a floor person, this is where I can get, you know, this at a discount. These are things that are really kind of difficult sometimes when you start flipping is you need a plumber, you didn't expect to, or and you don't know somebody. So if you're constantly what I call filling that bench now, so when you need to pull somebody off the bench to, to go, then you're in a lot better position when you find the deal. Does that make sense? So um, just understanding and knowing you do have to know what you're looking for a little bit there. So coming in here, meeting. Now, I will tell you, there's a lot of people that come to this group that aren't here today that are, they've been flipping for a while. So they've, they flip 15 homes, maybe plus a year that aren't here now. But if you come to groups like this on a regular basis, you will meet them. And you can shadow them, you can talk to them and find out what their expectations are for people like this. There are other things out there that you can get a hold of like um, standards of operations and uh, job descriptions. I feel like that's like a discussion for another day just because there's so much in that. Because you, you need to have expectations if you hire somebody, right? You know, I mean, there's people that take advantage of people all the time and just being able to to understand that and know what to look for is important. So coming in to stuff like this is gonna help or the pit group. Uh, never stop finding people is key. If you wanna really get a flipping business to start moving and not waste your time and not waste your money, always having people on the bench is key. Okay, this is my plug, you guys. Um, I am gonna give you calculations, I promise, they're right after this, okay? Because I know that's what people are looking for. But I am, um, I have a website, it's a GoDaddy website too, but I have actually hired somebody to redo it and it's almost out. But the same URL goes to that site. So if you look at this one, then you can make fun of me when the new one comes out. So the QR code's on here too, but I would love for you guys to actually help um, me by subscribing to my YouTube channel we are doing vlogs, I'm doing stuff like this, I'm just really trying to build 
my speaking and education side when it comes to real estate and real estate investing. So if you guys have a YouTube and you wouldn't mind subscribing, I would love you for it. I thank you. Thank you so much for coming. All right. So when I transitioned into Florida, when I started flipping property, I was in Georgia. And when I moved to Florida, I became more of a realtor for investors. So I was actually doing their valuations for them. So I would find the property, I would call the investor, I'd say, here's this property and you should offer this much, you can put this much into it and you can sell it for this much. Okay, so at that point I'd flip property myself. I had like seven, I think, under me. So I, I pretty much knew values, enough of values to be able to do this. So there's a really quick way to look at a property valuation, if it's a deal or not. And then if it's close to that, then it's something that we kind of step forward in or an investor should step forward in, okay? So I work this kind of backwards, right? So what's your selling price? So you look at a property and you're like, that's a good deal because if it was fixed up, it can sell for X dollars, right? So 350. You could take that number, multiply it by 65 or 70%. And what you're doing is you're taking out the expenses. You're assuming that you would spend about 15, 20% on renovations and about 10% or so on cost, selling cost. So just back that out real quick. So on this one, 350 multiplied, I think by 70% minus whatever profit you want to make, that's your purchase price. Does that make sense? It's pretty easy. Um, it doesn't work fully every single time because there's going to be times where, let's just say, you pick up a property and you only have to paint it and put floors in, right? And it's going to take you a week. Then you can get it back on the market and you'd probably make a little bit less on it, right? Because it's just such a quick flip. You'd be okay with that. But in all in all, if you're teaching yourself and learning right now about properties, looking at foreclosures on Zillow or just evaluating yourself, look at a property, look on the map, right? On Zillow, this house is selling for 200 and all the houses around it are selling for 350. You drive by the neighborhood, you're like, yeah, it looks the same, what's going on? All right, so then you're like, oh, I could 350 times 70% or 65 to be a little more conservative, minus I wanna make 50,000, I wanna make 40,000 or whatever man, I can buy that. I can offer. It's listed at 200. I can offer 175 and see if they'll take it. Easy enough. Reality one is next. It worked out about the same and it pretty much does, except, you know, our profits got larger. All right. I know it's kind of hard to see. If you want to, I don't know if you can pull the blinds down or if you want to photo that. This is going to take a lot more explanation, but I promise if you sit down and look at it, you'll be able to, to tell what's going on. So I put some percentages on there. That's like the advanced class because not a lot of people run on percentages. Um, but you hear the term ROI, you hear the term cash on cash return, um, or what's your net profit. So really what we're concerned with, uh, return on investment. Um, so your net profit divided by your total cost. Um, if you're just wondering how much you're going to make on your cash, then you're down at the bottom. So on that one, we made a lot more on our cash. Then it gets a lot more complicated when you are like investors and stuff. So you, you will have a couple other lines. So if you're looking at becoming a part of flipping because you want to invest your cash, then I can help you come up with the calculations to look for here. So, you know, say, Suzanne, you had 50 grand and you're like, I just want to make money on my money, then, sorry, this is really small, then you can become this person. This private investor charges 1%, maybe 2% up front. They charge a 9% or up to a 15% percentage, which is like usually annually, so annual percentage on that. But a lot of times they'll do, like if it's a three-month flip, this person um, will be guaranteed like, three months or six months at least of interest payments, even if they flip it in less time, if that makes sense. And then part or all of refi, like you can, some investors, so for me, um, there's times where I was a 50%, I give 50,000, I wouldn't make any money on it, and I get 50% of the profits at the end. 
That's just like the simple way. So I was like, I'm gonna give my 50, I'm gonna help you sell it as a realtor, I'm still gonna get paid as a realtor, but I'm also going to get 50% of the profits. And then I would do other things like design it and all that stuff. And then there's investors that want nothing to do with it and that's them. All right, rewind. So cash and lenders, finding out where you're gonna get your money from. So there, we use Kiabi right now, which used to be lendinghome.com. Um, companies like that are uh, hard money lenders. And what typically, there's a bunch of them out there. If you even type in lending home on Google, you will find six, seven, eight other lenders on there. And they have an application process. You're typically putting like your LLC in there and then you're guaranteeing that yourself as a person. What's cool about this is if you have cash, you don't have to use it. But if you don't want to use your cash, then you've got a line of credit and it's a pretty easy way once you get things going to get cash on a house. Um, I would suggest that everybody at least try. Put your stuff in there, see if they'll let you do something. Some of them will actually want you to invest with somebody that's already invested before or have some kind of guarantor the first time and then they'll kind of keep you on there after that. So that's a way there's, um, where's the lender? I'm sorry, that was here. There she is. Um, so there's other ways and, and she can explain that. And we have other lenders in this group that have lending um, programs as well. Cash out refi, you've got rental property, you've got a house, you can afford a higher payment in that house. So you cash out refi, get some money out of that property. You can start investing. You can buy your own properties. You can invest with somebody else. Um, private money lending, I explained, and then partnerships. So like partnering with people. Hey, I've got 100,000, or hey, I can do all the work. I don't have any money, things like that. Those are all ways that you can be get money to invest in property. Um, do you want to come up here? Sorry. <laughs> um, so I was saying we do delayed financing. So if you buy an investment property with cash and within six months you want to do financing, that will give you renovation cash out. So basically it's a cash out refi that is delayed. So, you know, if you purchase that property and tie up all your cash, but you want to get some back out, we will get some post rental value um, for the appraisal. So, does that make sense? Did y'all get everything? Is it a lot? It's a lot. So, I mean, the key, really, it's, it's about you guys getting out and start doing the, the work. I mean, it's just having those conversations. What I think is really cool about that is we hold ourselves back with, kind of weird things that we tell ourselves, like, uh, it's weird to have that conversation, I don't really know what to say. Um, you know, like the neighbor passed away and there's, you know, the, the kids are over there and you're like, gosh, I wonder what they're gonna do with the house. <laughs> and you're like, it's a really odd conversation to have, right? And we talk ourselves out of it. We talk ourselves out of having that conversation for one reason or another, but the, I'm telling you, the gold is in finding those deals and just getting comfortable having those conversations. And before you know it, you're going to be like, you know, I need to make $100,000 or more to flip a property. You're going to have that many deals come into you. Um, any other questions or suggestions on where to go with this next for you guys to, to move forward and, and start flipping or purchasing? Are there any other missing pieces, I should say? Well, I hope that you got something out of today and just know that we are here to really help you build wealth through real estate, little by little. It's a journey, it's not gonna happen overnight. Yes, there's people out there that have gotten really good deals and they've made the hundreds or 200 thousands and that's great. Um, but if you don't have good processes and good systems and if you're not coming at it from a business perspective, that's not gonna last very long. So if you know that's you, that's great inspiration for people. And if it's a friend, that's great inspiration for you. But this right here is what's gonna get you started and rolling and really probably rubbing elbows with the same type of people on a consistent basis. Don't lose your dream of doing this because your time is being spent out there doing other things or around people that aren't talking about it. Put it in your mind get on bigger pockets, get on YouTube, listen to the stuff on a, on a daily basis and you'll 
get, get excited about it and stay excited about it. And then come to this group, please, because we're here every second Tuesday at 530. And we will continue to bring in people that have a wealth of knowledge and that are pouring into you guys. I have been asked to bring a CPA in. Um, and we're working on it. I've actually met with it. We're meeting with a new one that specializes in real estate and they were in Tennessee. So if we can get them down here, we absolutely will. Um, and then get with us on our Northwest or REIG, NorthwestFlorida.com, REIG, NWF.com. Send me your email so I can send everything back out to you guys so you guys can start connecting with each other. All right, we've got more pizza. You guys go eat, network amongst each other, exchange numbers. Thank you so much for coming and we'll see you next month.